Oh, let's pray. Father, <laughs> we just, uh, we were coming to you, uh, not just for understanding of your word today, but I pray that you would move uh, both my, my mouth and those that are going to share today in a way that would uh, open and renew the way we think about you. Uh, that Jesus, you, you came, as John the Baptist said, it says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And today we repent because we've come to change the way we think, which is to repent. We've come to renew our minds unto you in the way that you want to teach, train, equip, and pour into your body for this, the greatest time ever to be alive. And I thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Whew, it's going to be powerful. Um, when I was writing this message uh, I don't know if you've ever written a message before, but sometimes you'll get a word. Like you'll say, I'm going to get a word and minister the word. And I received a word, a verse. And uh, I've always told myself, ah, I just need a verse and I can minister for two or three hours, you know, under the Holy Spirit, under the anointing. But this message is different, and I wanted it to uh, be confirmed. And I waited for about a week, no confirmation. I come in the door, I literally walked right here, and someone came up to me and spoke the word of the Lord that I had prepared, like almost word for word. This is always encouraging. If you're not aware, that's a good thing. Not just for my sake, but I don't take lightly the, the, the privilege it is to come up here. There's been mighty men and women of God, including many of you, that have come up here and ministered uh, to the body. And I, I take this responsibility with the way it should be, which is it's an honor and it's a privilege. But it's also very weighty up here. If you've ever tried to stand up here, it's, it's the, the weight of the Lord, uh, the kabod, the, the word talks about the kabod. Sometimes you see me hanging under this. It's not to look cool. It's because I literally need to stand, stay standing in the presence of the Lord. He indwells the praises of his people. When you guys worship like that, he comes down and inhabits the praises of his people. Um, Lou, would you come forth? So as I'm walking in the door, literally Lou, Lou's like, I said, what is God showing you? And she says, oh, you're not going to. And she shares this, and I want her to share it with you. Check. Highway of holiness. I am making headway today in this house, and I am straightening the path that leads directly into my heart of hearts. I will have me a people of purity, love, simplicity, and full of joy. My people have become too entangled in the world system. I am calling for a refocus of truth and love. I have hope and a future for this people. Look beyond the natural and see the fullness of what I wish to do in and through you as you press into me more. There is so much more in the simplicity of doing and calling upon me and letting me change you and filling you with all that I wish to do and through you today. Release your focus upon the now and let me pour into you what needs to be given for what I have desired to do in you for this now time. It is so much bigger than ever even dreamed of. It is of me, and know that it is good. Amen. Thank you. Aren't you glad God speaks? Amen. <clears throat> Today, my heart's cries has been voiced as uh, to see the glory of the Lord poured out upon all the churches that have gathered in the name of Jesus here in New Bern and in this region and all over. But New Bern is ours. You know, we live here. Um, it's more than home. It's a It's a... A place that God's called us to transform. Otherwise, he would move you someplace else. But we're called to transform cities. And in order to transform cities, the only way I know that you can't litigate that, you can't make laws and regulations because how many of you know people break laws and like it just doesn't work? You know, you can, you can think that you vote in uh, uh, one party and they're going to bring you hope and change, and then you get tired of that, and you vote in another party and think you've solved the problem, but how many of you know that the change has to happen in the hearts of men, not at the litigation table? Not in Washington, D.C. is not the heartbeat of America. You are. And the change has to happen within the people. Um, Jesus comes and says, you know, I didn't come to, I'm not disregarding the law. I've come to fulfill it fully. In me is the, the fulfillment of the law. So I believe that there's a change coming in the hearts of, of men upon, upon the land known as America. It's all over the world, but again, we're speaking here and we live here, and in particular in New Bern. When you were singing that song where it says that he, he'll become a lamp unto my feet, I just got wrecked and I wrote this down because if you've been walking, they say walking with the Lord, notice they don't call it, are you running with the Lord? Are you sprinting with the Lord? They call it walking with the Lord. 
And I kind of got a revelation on that because he pretty much is a lamp unto your feet. And if you've ever carried a lamp in the dark of the night, it only lights up about enough to take the next step. Am I the only one? Like, does everybody else have spotlights of the Lord? Because I have a lamp. And if you have a spotlight, I would love to exchange that and learn how to operate in that. <clears throat> See, faith, faith comes by hearing and hearing of the word. And the word is the next word that comes out of my mouth is the next word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We need to learn to pay attention to the next word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Jesus is tempted and, and he said, you know, the Satan says, you know, if you are who you say, if you are the son of God, then and you're hungry, turn that rock into bread. He says, no, no, man doesn't live by bread alone, but every word that comes out of my father's mouth is how I live. That means he's paying attention to every single word that comes out. I, I joke about this, but it's so serious. Like the hardest price to pay on the earth, the biggest price you will ever pay in your life. If you, if you really learn this, it'll set you free in a lot of ways is, is you pay attention. Like God is speaking. Lou is just coming in to soak in the presence of God and intercede. And she's working with our precious little people in the back, lifting them up, teaching them how to, to interact with God. And she hears the word of the Lord. What if we had a whole, I mean, it doesn't take, what if we had this many people doing that? And I'm not saying we don't, we do, but as more come, can you imagine what could happen? Could a city be changed? <sighs> like you're getting the word of the Lord every day. This is why we're pressing forward. This is why we're stepping into the good things of God is to, to listen to every word that comes out of his mouth. All right, I had this really funny joke I was going to tell. Now it's not even worth telling because it's, it's, it's so good. All right. Last time I was here, I ministered uh, on, on choosing between the world's way and choosing that way or the word of the Lord. And if you don't remember that message, you might remember this. I said, you have to get the L out of the world, right? And that gives you the word. And you have this crossroads and this choice. Um, every church in New Bern, I believe, is, is experiencing what we're experiencing to different measures um, but there are testimonies pouring in all over this city, and many of ours uh, that attend this body of believers are actually in other cities. Several are, are in the city of the brotherly love in Philadelphia. Did you guys know that? There's about, what, about a dozen of them or so, or I don't know, half a dozen? Seven, eight? Okay. So they went up to minister at a church that the, uh, Pastor Jamie Galloway, I believe, ministers at, and they were called and sent uh, to go minister in uh, prophecy and in love. And uh, Mike and Steph are down in Florida ministering to his family. My beautiful bride is in Charlotte attending a women's conference. Uh, there are several others that are on the road, I believe, here too. That's what I love about this body of believers is that the expectation isn't to come. It's to go, right? Like if you're sitting too long in this church and not going, we're gonna be like, is everything all right? You know, do you... What's going on? And because that's the word of the Lord. In Matthew, he says, go into all the world. Go to every nation. And I, honestly, it's been like a dream of mine. I didn't grow up in church. I, I, I read the Bible after I got born again, after God encountered me. And as I would read these things, I just assumed that all y'all just met like that in the Bible. Like I figured like, man, they'd show up and worship like that. And then a word would come forth hopefully like this, and that everybody would go out like what I was reading in my Bible and do that. I, I didn't think that there was another way. And my thinking has impacted the way I believe, and my beliefs impact the way that I function, and, I, and the way that I function is a result of my beliefs and my thinking. Does that make sense? Like when I read the Word, I believe what it says. It makes sense to me. Like lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. You know what I mean? Or, or minister in truth and in love. You know, I mean, these things were not foreign to me because I didn't have someone to show me that it wasn't true. Today, my prayer is that all false doctrine, all false teachings, and all false beliefs and false thinking would come off of you today. Ooh, that's, that's a lot to ask for. I got a big God. And I believe the word is going to break it. So if you have your Bibles... Let's open directly into uh, Romans chapter 12. <clears throat> That's a lot to ask. Like, does anybody else have the boldness? Like, what do you have faith for today? Was it the word I heard out of worship? Were you singing that? 
Were you screaming that? Because it was like in my heart, just going, ah, I have faith today that the word of the Lord is going to break off false teachings, false doctrines, false beliefs, and, and incorrect thinking that does not line up with the heart of the Father. Whoa, what if that happened today? Like, how would you walk out of here differently? <sighs> Holy Spirit, you've heard the desires of the people, Lord. Romans 12, if we go down just a verse into verse 2, it says this, do not be conformed to this word, this world. Uh, be conformed to this word, right? But do not be conformed to this world. So I'm going to stop there real quick because why is it important that this is a, com- this is a command, by the way? Why is this command even there? I believe it's because it's still possible to be conformed to the world despite being a new creation in Christ. That world, the world is constant, it's persistent, it's pervasive. If you believe the lies of the world and let it in, oh, it's got a full buffet for you. You know what I mean? If you let one morsel in, it'll just keep coming. It doesn't stop. It's like the waves of the ocean. It just keeps coming. But let's read on in the next section here. It says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And before I go any further, I want to talk about responsibility. I love this because God gave me this word a long time ago um, about responsibility. We have to understand that when we read this verse about the, you know, the renewed mind, the transform, transformed mind, that Jesus is responsible for something and he's done his part. Like his job, his goal, his mission was to open up a way for you to go into, the heaven, into heaven and to open up a way unto the Father. No one goes to the Father except through Jesus. End of story. Beginning of story. But in regards to this, end of the story. But we have a part to play. And one of the things that's hard is um, renewing of your mind is our part. It is our pursuit. I I don't know if there's a more important teaching, training, and equipping in the body of Christ uh, than to renew our minds. And And I'll tell you why just shortly, but I believe it's our part. It's our active part. It's by his grace that he's going to allow it, but it's through our willingness to listen to every word that proceeds out of his mouth to be renewed. Holy Spirit. And I love the word responsibility because God would never give you an assignment that you weren't able to respond to. The word responsibility means to be able to respond to it. So what I'm not something that you're not equipped to do. To do. Now, knowing Jesus as your Lord and Savior and being filled with the Holy Spirit are what really make this a reality. And if that's not a reality in your life, I want you to approach me at any time during this message and I'll stop everything because that's something we want to take hold of right now. Holy Spirit, I just pray that you would speak today spirit to spirit and truth to truth, that uh, every word of mine would fall into the heart of men and plant deep into uh, into their spirit and that it would grow mighty in your name, Jesus, that it would bear much fruit. Not one of your words, Jesus, would fall to the ground. And I just speak to each person's spirit. I'm speaking to who you really are, not your name, not your flesh, not your body, but who you really are, called by Jesus before the foundations of the earth. God stitched you and knew you before he even stitched you together. I'm speaking to that person right now that you would have ears to hear and eyes to see today. In Jesus' name. Whew. Man. So the word transformed in this verse is so that we might do something, that we might prove the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. What's his will? What's God's will? It's kind of rhetorical, but if you shout it at me, I'll I'll hear you, plus I need to get a drink here. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's it's called the Lord's Prayer. It's also, also the disciples' prayer, that they were praying that that the Father in heaven, who's holy, that his will that's happening in the heavenly realms would happen on the earth through you. So when we look at a transformed mind, we're really saying, 
We want to have that will that's happening up in a heavenly place happening down here. I can't remember what it was. I had some sort of pain or ache, and someone said, well, there's no pains and aches in heaven, so I'm going to pray that that would be done with here. And it instantly, like, healed, like, my body. I was like, whoa, that's revelation. You know, like, I'm tired. Well, there's no tiredness in heaven, so we need to remove that in Jesus' name, right? Um, I had a knee pain the other day, and my daughter, little Ellie, if you saw her, she runs around here. I said, oh, I got this knee pain. She, oh, I pray for it, Daddy. Pain, go away. Uh, I, God, I pray that that pain just go away right now. In Jesus' name, amen. And then both my kids always do this because they just have that expectant childlike faith. Does it feel better? Like two seconds afterwards they pray, and I'm like, man, they're really calling me out. Like, I got to test it. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, but will you do it again? Sure. There's no like, no, nah, you idiot. I've already prayed. You know, she has the faith and the love and the compassion. God, heal daddy's knee in Jesus' name, amen. That's the will of the Father. That's what's happening up in the heavenly realms. And I'm pointing up because it's really not up. It's really at hand because Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So that reality is a reality. It's just that our thinking has to change. Holy Spirit. Here's the challenge of the body, I think, right now that many of you have a good theological answer to that question I just asked. You know, what is the will of the Father? But a good theological answer is not enough. I I can tell you it's not enough. I'm not going to embarrass you, youth, but younger people, raise your hand. Lucas, your whole crew there, this gentleman here. How old are you? 17. Like, a good theological answer is not going to be enough for them. Why? Because they have access to everything. If they want answers, they'll go find them. They want to encounter a living God. And if you can't demonstrate that to them, they're gonzo. They'll go to the next thing. Am I right? Then the next person that gets a hold of them can say, well, I can demonstrate to you witchcraft and there's a power there and they see it and they operate in it and they can demonstrate it and they say, oh, there's, that's something that's real. Whew. Like we make this gospel all about us all the time. And when we make it about us, we miss the greatest opportunity of all because if it was all about me for the person that ministered to you, you would have never heard about it. Someone knew it was about you when they ministered to you. I know my story. Two guys ministered to me when I was on death's door. If the gospel was about them, they would have left me to die. But it was about me for them. Do you know what I'm saying? Who is it for? Who is this gospel for? For those that are saved, called by his name, it's to take it unto the world, to demonstrate the goodness of God. Jesus didn't go around saying, this is all for me. I'm just going to sit here and meditate, levitate, and die at 33. He went around saying, this is for everybody. This is for you. Oh, for the afflicted, it's for you. For the downtrodden, it's, for, it's especially for you. For the drug addict or the alcoholic, or if they even had that thing back then, I'm sure they did because it's been, it's for you. For the prostitute, it's especially for you. Do you know what I'm saying? Man, I love worship. A lot of times, one of my favorite places to go and worship besides here is this place called the House of Prayer. It's a rehab center for all men who have been set free from drugs and alcohol through the power and presence of Jesus Christ. And when you walk into that place, nobody is late to go worship at that place. Like when worship starts, you have 30 guys who have been at the bottom and know what it's like to not have anything in their life and have been totally transformed through Jesus. And when they worship, man, the rafters literally shake. The floor starts to move. You get men crying out because they realize that God actually has done something in their life. Like, don't go out and do drugs and just fall to the bottom just to have that story. God's probably met a lot of you in a really good place. My wife is always like, I don't have a testimony like yours. I just was seven. I accepted Jesus, and he's been with me my whole life, and my life's been awesome, and everything is awesome, right? And I'm like, well, that was the intention. That was the goal. That was Jesus' intention. Like, my story is not the story that his intention is, but yet he still redeemed me despite the length and the distance. His arm isn't so, sh- so short that he couldn't even reach any, anybody. So that should be encouragement to you if you have drug addicts, alcoholics, 
murderer, anybody in your family that has fallen so far, God is not so short-sighted that he doesn't have a way for them back. But the goal was my wife's story. I'm like, that's the best testimony in the world. That's why it's so important to minister back there. Holy Spirit. Wow. Whew. All right. Only a divine encounter brings real transformation that proves God's perfect will. It's easy to settle for a good theological understanding versus the divine encounter. How many of you during worship felt in your heart and your, maybe around you or in the general atmosphere a shift of closeness, a closerness to God than before? Like, if, if you didn't, I understand, but there were, there's real encounter in worship. The goal is to take this type of atmosphere and take it into your daily life all the time where you're worshiping, whoa, where you're worshiping Him in spirit and truth, and you're walking in this divine encounter of the closeness of God all the time. When we, when we, when we interview the greatest men and women of God around the world, when I say great, those that have ministered the gospel to more and seen more people saved, in particular, I'm thinking of Reinhard Bonnke in my mind, when they ask him, what is the secret to your success in kingdom ministry, he's not hesitant to reply with one answer. I'm al- he says, I'm always aware that God is with me. Always. And if God's with you, who can be against you? When you're confronted with sin or temptation, if the awareness of God with you is real, the temptation is no longer even there. All right? Like, is anybody struggling with sin in their life? All you got to do is just realize that the closeness of God is with you during the temptation and declare that the closeness of God is with you and the temptation has to flee because there is no sin in the presence of the Lord. The deception is that the presence of God is not with you. This is not true. Christ in you is the hope of glory. Christ is in you. Can you shut that awareness off? Absolutely. You have free will. <laughs> Holy Spirit. I got like 17 messages going in my mind. Right now, have you ever been like, I just feel like I'm running in mud? But I feel like this is going to go somewhere, right? Amen? All right, let's do this. I want to tell you about some things that have changed my mind encounters that have literally changed the way I think. One time I was in the Dominican Republic and I was ministering to this group of people and they wanted prophecy and I'm like, I will prophesy here to the last person and then 300 people lined up. And I was there till like two, three in the morning, word after word after word. And, and I was amazed at the goodness of God that he would actually use me and give me the stamina with no energy drinks, no water, no food, just me standing and the Holy Spirit ministering. I saw one person completely de- delivered from de- demons where her eyes went from like blood red to white. The next night she brought her whole family to get saved, healed and delivered from demonic uh, activity and accept Jesus as Lord. And th- hundred, 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 three hundred people. And I saw this happen and, and I I was just amazed and it changed my mind about how God could use me. Uh, one time I was, uh, I was uh, teaching my son, many of you know this, on how to encounter uh, Jesus in heavenly realms. And one day he wakes up the next day and he tells me about this experience with Jesus. He's 28 months old. He can barely even talk, but he's talking about how he's encountered Jesus. It totally transformed my mind of how Jesus wants to operate. I was ministering at that house of prayer that I was telling you about, and this football player, this ex-pro football player who had gone into pain medication addiction, giving him a word of knowledge. I said, you used to be a pro football player. You used to, you're on drugs. And he's like, yeah, how did you know that? I'm like, I don't know, but God wants to heal you. And he comes up, and his leg, his ankle is locked into place with a steel plate. And as he comes up, he says, I want you to pray for me that this would be healed. And I said, well, what is it? He says, I have a steel plate. I can't, he couldn't move it. It was locked. And I had not experienced any steel plates evaporating in my life. And I looked at him and I said, stand up for a second, Ben. You're kind of like this big guy. I said, I'll pray for you in a moment. That's, I got to just finish this word. Just go ahead and sit down. Go sit right here. Just sit here. And my faith was about this big. Can you see that? It's like as tiny as a mustard seed. I didn't have the right thinking. I had never seen it done before. So he sat and I ministered. It was family day. It was visitation day. So the aunts and uncles and moms and dads of those in this kind of rehab center had come. 
And they stood up and all wanted to receive the Holy Spirit. And I laid hands on nobody and they all fell in the the presence of the Lord and received the Holy Spirit. And I thought this was a really good time to leave because I had a three-hour drive home. So I grabbed my bag and this man was here and I walked out. And as I was walking out, he ran after me. And he said, Brent, can you wait a moment? (laughs) He's like, can you wait one moment? I said, oh, I I purposely, not purposely, intentionally, unintentionally forgot about you. (laughs) And he says, look it, look what the Lord's done. And he moved his ankle. I don't have a grid for that. I didn't have a grid for that. I didn't touch the man, but in the presence of the Lord, all things are possible. Now I know that. Someone come, I have a steel plate in my back. Not that there's a program or a procedure, but sometimes I'll just be like, hey, let's just sit down in the presence of God. There's healing in here. It was pronounced before we even started worship. If there's anybody that needs healing in their body, this is the atmosphere that God wants to do. You may have already been healed and don't even know it. Check yourself. Father, I just declare that healing is moving through this place, that there's, there's no ailment that can stand in the presence of God. That in the presence of the God, when that kingdom of heaven invades this, this reality of what we call earth, or the reality, it can't stay anymore. This is such good news. And the good news of this is when we transform my, our minds, we can take this reality out into that reality and change that reality and transform it. It can be a city with no illness. It can be a city where they're building a brand new cancer ward. Did you know that here in New Bern? And they're going to have to call it something else. Have to call it the like hangout center or the youth recovery fun fabulous Jesus place. I don't know, but if you guys all together will go out and invade the city with the presence of the Lord and the awareness of God in you, the hope of glory, we can transform a city. This is this is big stuff. Maybe it's maybe it's for another time. I was in Canada, and I'm telling you these testimonies because it's important. I was in Canada, and. We had this ministry, and I had prayed just before the service, God, don't let me ever preach your word where the demonic are comfortable sitting in the presence of your word. And so he honored that. People started manifesting demons in the middle of the meeting, and I was rather freaked out. But God showed me how to deliver them. I deliver one person in the name of Jesus that Jesus doesn't want that spirit in them, and they don't want it. He gets it out. Another person, another person. And then this young lady kind of looks like you. She had glasses on. She was sitting up here. She came up. She says, I want prayer, I want prayer. And I did kind of the same thing. So if I ever do this to you, like, it's a good thing. Hey, go ahead and just sit here. I'm, I'm praying for this person. And as I'm praying, I'm in a closed room like this and this cold breeze blows over my shoulder and blows her hair back to where the people behind her get hit. And they're like, what was that? And I'm like, I don't know, I didn't do it. And I walk up to her, I said, did you want prayer? And she said, yes. She had glasses on, and I went to go lay hands on her, and the Lord said, don't touch her. I stopped, and her glasses began to fog up as if someone was breathing in her face. (sighs) (sighs) Fog, not fogged. Now, I'm not the only one seeing it, because I'm like, can you see this? And everybody's like, yeah. And I'm like, God told me not to touch her, so she's good to go. She got filled with the Holy Spirit. She'd been crying out for 20 years, she said, to get filled with the Holy Spirit. She never felt like she received it. By her faith, she sat there, and God honored that and did it himself. I didn't have a grid for that. I had no thinking for that. I didn't say, sit here, and then a breeze will blow over my shoulder, then your glasses will fog up. (laughs) I'm going somewhere with this. Miracles and signs and wonders follow those who believe according to the word. The renewed mind is one where we (sighs) accept that there are things that we don't fully understand, but we don't need to cry out for understanding. We cry out for the presence of God to show up. And the church has taught for so long that you would understand. You need understanding. You need understanding. You need, under- you need Jesus. Give me, give me more Bible studies. Give me more Bible studies. And there's nothing wrong with studying the Bible, but there is something wrong with studying the Bible if you're not willing to invite the author into the meeting to come and share what he's written. No more, no more. This is an era where the things are shifting and changing. That you're like these children. No demonstration of the goodness of God. It's not good enough for me. I can't have another good sermon. We can't, can't camp around another good message. We need the presence of God. Uh, 
among us, in us, on us, around us. We want it all, <laughs> right? <sighs> Had no grid for this. When Jesus shows up, he brings revelation. And the word revelation actually has the word veil in it. It means to be unveiled or to remove the veil, which means that the truth already existed in it, but Jesus pulled the veil from our eyes to reveal it. Revelation that he can melt steel was a truth before he melted the steel in the man's leg. He revealed it to us as we witnessed it. The revelation that he can come and blow like the wind that it says like a mighty rushing wind in Acts is a truth that was already existing before he revealed it to me. What is truth that he's yet to reveal to you? I believe there's so much. I mean, I could, t- I could talk now until eternity and I don't think we would even come close to understanding the truths that are available to us. Are angels and angelic beings a reality? Take them out of the Bible and you lose a lot of your Bible. How many of our eyes are blinded to angels? Father, open up our eyes that we might see. <laughs> Not so that we would worship them or dance around them. Maybe we'll dance around them. I don't know. But they're usually messengers from God. That's a pretty good thing, right? How many of you could use a message from God? Mary needed one when she, when she was about to... Uh, be overtaken by the Holy Spirit, impregnated by God, and give birth to the Savior of the world, took an angel to minister to her. If that's not enough for you, Joseph, who's a little concerned that his unslept with wife is now pregnant, needed an angel to come minister to him to tell him it's okay. Messengers are pretty important. This isn't a message about angels. I just felt like I needed to go there. I mean, what are we missing out on because of our limited thinking? <laughs> Let me tell you something that I've been finding about Transform Mind. Any place in your life right now that you lack hope, if you lack hope in any place, you've embraced a lie or a series of lies in your life. If there's any place in your life that you're hopeless, you've been supporting the lie that has told you to be hopeless there. The only thing that breaks that lie is the truth. And the truth sets you free. I don't know what lies you've embraced and You don't have to tell me. You might not even know. But I know one thing. If we pray, they can come off right now. Let's pray. Ooh, and I want you to keep your eyes open. If I had my eyes closed, I would have missed that hair blowing back. I would have missed her her glasses fogging up. You know, for those who have ears to hear and eyes to see, um, I believe God wants you to see what he wants to do for you. Now, Father, uh, break every lie and command it to leave right now in Jesus' name. Those that we've believed ourselves and supported and those that have been told to us by false teachers, preachers, or prophets, we break it off now in the name of Jesus and it no longer has a place in our life. Any false teachings, we forgive those who have brought us any false teachings because they did not know. And we just break that off in Jesus' mighty name. Any place that we've come into agreement, Holy Spirit, uh, with, with any uh, deceptiveness or, or wickedness, whew, we break that off right now in Jesus' mighty name. And now, Father, where the lies have been broken, would you just press into each person the truth? And I know one thing is that you are the way, you are the truth, you're the life. You start to minister to each person right where they're at and open up their heart and bring and reveal. Now, I also pray, Father, over the minds and and. and of each, that it would be renewed by the hearing of your word, that it would be renewed by your presence, and that it would not just be a one-time occurrence, that this this would be a constant occurrence. There's some of you actually feeling like dizzy, because there's, when false thinking comes out of your mind, it literally transforms you physiologically. (sighs) Thank you, Lord. I'm doing this because I can feel like a whirlwind in most of your heads right now, and I just say, that's the Lord. He wants to get that stuff out of you. He comes like a wind. He wants to move it out of your thinking. And I declare that in his name. Holy Spirit. He wants to move us beyond our own thinking life and beyond our limited dreams and beyond our limited hopes. Every time that, whoa, we lack hope and we embrace the lie, what happens is he comes greater than anything we could hope, dream, or imagine. So whatever you think... God's capable of, 
no matter what you think he's capable of, he's capable of more than that because he delivers more than you can hope, dream, or imagine. Now, I know some of you got some awesome imaginations for the kingdom, right? For the kingdom of God. He wants to deliver more than that according to his word. Holy Spirit. The renewed mind is the primary target of God. When he speaks a word to you, like I talked about last week, it's going to be challenged. We don't even have time to go into that, but I did it last week. Go watch the video. 2 Corinthians. I'm going to read this quickly. Verse 16. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 16. But whenever someone turns to the Lord... The veil is taken away. This is our part. This is what we're responsible for. Doesn't it logically think that, like, don't you think that, um, like, if he takes the veil away from me, then I'll turn to him? That's the prayer of most Christians. Take this veil away, and then I'll turn to you. It says this. But whenever someone turns to the Lord... Another word would be then or the, then the veil is taken away. You want the veils taken away from your life? Turn to the Lord. That's why great theological answers and great Bible studies don't get it done. Although those things are powerful, we need to turn to the Lord first, and then the veil will be removed from us. However you do that, I don't know if that's like, here I am, oh, God's over here, I turn. I don't think it's like that. Turn to the Lord in all your way. Turn to him for every answer that you have. You got financial troubles, turn to the Lord. You got marriage troubles, turn to the Lord. Someone just died in your family and it's, it, and it's tragic, turn to the Lord. You've got pain in your body, turn to the Lord. You've got a disappointment from missing every appointment in life, turn to the Lord. You're young and depressed, turn to the Lord. You're old and depressed, turn to the Lord. You're just depressed, turn to the Lord. Because when you turn to the Lord out of depression, you'll become impressed and not depressed anymore with what God wants to do in your life. He's impressive. He's been faithful every time I've turned to him. There's not been one time he's let me down. I can't say that about any of you or even me. I've let myself down, turn to the Lord. I let my wife down, turn to the Lord. I let my family down, turn to the Lord. I had dreams and visions and goals, and I I don't think I'll ever attain them. Turn to the Lord. He put them in there. He's the one that gave them to you. He's the one that'll fulfill them. It's not logical, is it? It's supernatural. Philippians 4, verse 8 says this. And I like it because it has the word finally in it. And I'm about done, so this makes total sense. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, and whatever is just, whatever is pure and lovely, and whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worth praise, think about those things. This morning I get up, I make this breakfast, mom's away. So I don't want them to come, mom to come home and they're like, we never ate anything but pizza and candy, right? Because I joke, my wife, she has this board on her house that says, Monday we're having lasagna and Tuesday this. And, th-, and I put on there, um, funny, it's funny, it's a joke. Uh, put, I put Friday, candy. Um, Saturday, beer and candy. And my wife is like, I am so nervous to leave right now. I'm like, I was joking. Well, I, I don't even drink beer, I'm joking. She's like, Please promise me you'll feed them. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I make this huge breakfast of toast and jams and cut apples and oranges and cereal. And uh, uh, what else did I have there? Um, orange juice, apple juice, water, milk. That way they can't say, I don't want this to drink. It's like, it's all there. I put the buffet before my kids. I put it all there. And the big thing I was trying to do is, is to avert this one objection that every parent hates I don't want this. It's like I put every this out there so I wouldn't hear that, including yogurt. I I had so many things. And I get out there, and there was only enough yogurt so Ellie could have it. So Lance comes out. (laughs) I wanted yogurt. And I'm like, really? Out of all the things I've blessed you with, and you're going to start your day focused on the thing that you lack, it's going to be a bad day for you, buddy. (laughs) Yeah. 
It's not going to be a good day. <laughs> and, I, and I wondered, like, do I do that with God? Like, he set the table for me? You know what I mean? Like, do I wake up in the goodness of God and his mercies enduring forever are before me, and I wake up and I'm like... I don't make enough money. I want yogurt. <laughs> and God's just like, are you serious? Like, I need to renew your mind. Like, your mind needs to be renewed of the bounty that's before you and the goodness of who I am. Maybe even just remember the many times before that you woke up and did have yogurt. The gospel of yogurt in Jesus' name. <laughs> we laugh because we all have done that, right? Amen. I wanted a Lexus and I've got a Honda. <laughs> really? Does it work? Is it working? God's good, right? He's a good God. Whew. I'm going to bring yogurt for everybody so you remember this message. One last story and I'm done. <clears throat> the renewed mind moves into action. That's how we know it's renewed. I was praying one time before the Newburn School of Supernatural Ministry that we do here in school, at the school last year. There was a young man sitting up there and I had this word stirring in my heart that somebody had prayed that day and they needed $200. And I just wanted to release that. So I said, somebody prayed here and they said they needed $200. Is that someone here? And nobody in the class raised their hand. And I'm like, I know I heard the Lord. And I didn't notice the guy in the sound booth who was like, it's me, dear God, it's me. And I'm like, nobody, and I look, I'm like, oh, and the young man, uh, he, I won't mention my name, but he came down. I said, come down here. And I reached in my wallet. Now, I ain't got the $200, okay? But faith activates, it, it's action. It's a renewed mind is that the word of the Lord has spoke, it's true. He came down, I said, I have 20, and that's what I had. That was all I had. And I handed it to him, and I said, the, the 200 is in the 20. I don't know how it's going to work, but God's going to reveal it to you, and he's going to take care of your need. If, if we're in a meeting like this, and he makes it aware, I mean, it's pretty sure that he wants to reveal himself, right? So I hand it to him, and I say, you know what? Kind of like the silver and gold, have I not, but what I do have, I give to you. Like, I didn't have what he needed, so I just laid hands on him. I said, God's going to bless you. And the power of God fell on this man so much, he just fell into a heap of God's goodness. And he just laid here, literally shaking in the glory of God. And I was like, I still had to teach, and I'm on, I'm on a clock, kind of like I feel right, right, right now. And I'm like, all right, well, he's fine. I'm going to minister. And I begin to minister. And see, when your mind gets transformed and you take the action, it changes the atmosphere, transforms the very atmosphere that you're in. And I never intended this. I started teaching, and all of a sudden, I saw someone come behind me. And I was like, continue to teach. I'm like, okay, maybe they have to take care of something. And they drop money on this young man. And I keep teaching, and another person, and I see somebody, I thought they were taking notes, and I wasn't even sharing anything that really good. So I'm like, why is she taking notes? She was writing a check. And she got up. She didn't have cash, but she got up and walked in front of me and dropped it. By the time this, minute, this service was done, this teaching was done, this man was just littered with money. Faith releases it. The transformed mind acknowledges it. Action changes the atmosphere. When you pray for the sick at Walmart or out on the street or even here, you literally change the atmosphere to reflect that of the kingdom of God. It shapes and shifts everything. <gasps> Maybe it is possible. Maybe breakthrough is available. Let's stand up. Like if I was really crafty with words, that would be like, all right, let's take up an offering. <laughs> but I've come to want to demonstrate the word of God, not by powerful words or eloquent language, but by the power of God. I believe that there is the power here right now to release you from every false thinking, but more importantly, to not just stop. See, people, you need to stop and quit thinking that way. Repent doesn't mean to stop thinking one thing. It means to turn towards something else that is greater than what you used to think. 
And what we turn to is what I've said is Christ Jesus. How foolish of me to give you the word to just stop and not give you the word to start something. I want you to grab hands. I want you to release this by faith amongst one another. But I just declare this over you. And if you're by yourself, come join. This is really, uh, we love, we're a touchy, lovey family here. And everybody likes to hold hands. Come on, Ken, get in there. If you're brand new, don't hesitate. Don't wait. We won't bite. Hold on. And if they do bite, they just love, it's a love bite. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Listen, release this over yourself and over the others. Activate this today. And I just declare this, that we are turning from our old ways of thinking, and we are not just stopping the bad thoughts. That's an easy message. I can go preach that in the secular world and make a million-dollar book out of it. I'm, I'm turning towards something, and I'm turning towards the goodness of Christ Jesus. And when I turn to you, Jesus, I get the revelation that you're already on the inside of me if I've accepted you as my Lord and Savior. If I've accepted you as Christ Jesus, my Lord, my Savior, and I've professed it by my faith, then you dwell on the inside of me. Christ in me is the hope of glory. Every solution to every problem I face and, and I, I get a chance to help, there's an answer on the inside of me, and his name's Jesus. Every uh, a shortcoming in the economy, every uh, sustainable energy problem, there's an answer on the inside of you, and his name is Jesus. Every uh, social dilemma with your family, with your neighbors, with your neighborhood, with your town, your city, your country, has an answer, and it is not Democrat or Republican, it's Christ Jesus. Every single problem that the world faces has an answer, and he's on the inside of you. And I'm acknowledging that today, that in you is Christ the hope of glory. Now, Father, move it from our, our thinking into our being, into our action, that we could transform this city and those cities that we go to by activating the truth of the gospel of who you are in us and through us. In Jesus' name, amen.